Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 21 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zeki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Thank you, Zeki. Good to be here. Uh, how are you doing this Sunday morning? I'm, I'm doing very well. I, I'm, I'm sitting relaxed. It's, it's kind of nice and uh, ready to have a fun conversation. And to that end, why don't you go ahead, do the honors, and please introduce uh, our guest. Switching things up a little bit, yeah. Uh, usually Zucky does the honors. Um, but it is indeed my honor this morning uh, and to our listeners to introduce and to welcome to the show Professor Sherman Abdul Hakim Jackson, who is the King Faisal Chair of Islamic Thought and Culture, Professor of Religion and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. Uh, he was formerly at uh, the University of Michigan. He has taught in the past uh, at the universities of, uh, of, of Texas, University of Texas, Wayne State University, Indiana. Uh, Professor Jackson received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and so it is indeed an honor. He is the co-founder, core scholar, member of the Board of Trustees of the American Learning Institute for Muslims, ALIM, out of Michigan, America and the former president of the Sharia Scholars Association of North America. That's a whole lot to say that uh, we are deeply honored to have Professor Jackson on the show. Welcome, Professor Jackson. Thank you, Professor. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. Uh, and on a personal note, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, Professor Jackson is someone that I consider to be a personal teacher, a personal mentor, uh, and someone that I've had the good fortune of studying with. So. Um, that it, it really means a lot to have you on the show. It's good to be here. Really good to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so now you, there you are in Southern California. Uh, prior to that, uh, we were together in Michigan. Um, but uh, I imagine your story sort of goes back uh, years prior to Michigan. If you, uh, we'd love to hear sort of your uh, early beginnings and your early roots uh, and, and, and sort of your background. Uh, my background going back how far? I mean, they're back, they're back now, I, I know I know that anyone who has heard you speak on a number of occasions or is a student of yours knows that you are you hail from uh, uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, born, I mean, raised, I mean, born and raised out there. I, I, I guess. I mean, I, I get the impression that, you know, sort of what you're alluding to is, uh, you know, the whole uh, the whole uh, conversion story. Is, is that is that? Is well, that... no, not necessarily. We'd like to know, you know, a little bit about Professor Jackson, the person as well. Uh, you um, know. Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was born in Philadelphia, uh, grew up in Philadelphia, um, sort of came of age. I mean, I was born in the, in the, in the mid fifties, uh, came of age, of course. I mean, I was a teenager in the, uh, in the mid sixties, uh, amidst, uh, yeah. lots of, uh, goings ons, uh, in, the, in the, in, in the country. Uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a very, uh, um, uh, urban, uh, context in Philadelphia. Um, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, now I, I can recognize that, you know, we, we grew up in a, in a, in a, in a poor neighborhood. Um, but at the time I, I didn't recognize it as, as poor. It was just, um, it was the neighborhood. Um, I, I, you know, I had had no exposure to anything else. And to be quite frank, um, I think that one of the things that I still wax nostalgic about, um, is the, very, very high and thick and, and deep uh, levels of, uh, of community um, that I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed as a child. Um, and, you know, the community uh, can come in a, in, a lot of different, in a lot of different forms. Philadelphia, you know, back in the, in the 60s, you know, all the way into the, um, into the, into the 70s uh, was a city that was... Um, very much defined by its uh, by its gang activity, mm. and um, one's life was really, to a real extent, sort of um, not defined, uh, uh, although in some instances maybe, but certainly informed um, by the geography of where one lived, and that geography itself was defined by um, the boundaries of uh, the boundaries of gang territory. Mm. Um, 
So that was always uh, a part of uh, sort of my mental landscape. And uh, it's, it's funny, um, you know, even I haven't been back to Philadelphia in a couple of re- few years now, but, but when I do, um, you know, my mental map is still sort of informed um, by those realities. And when I go to certain parts of the city still today, um, I get a certain tingling um, that uh, sort of reminds me um, of where I am. Um, so, I, you know, I, I grew up, um, you know, in that kind of, uh, in that kind of uh, reality. I, um, is is Philadelphia know, pretty segregated? I mean, was it you know, like racially segregated? No, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was very segregated. But in some ways, you know, um, that, that was um, what made it feel unsegregated, if, if that makes sense to you. In other words, I mean, um, you know, I saw white people when um, the insurance man came to the house back in those days. You know, you know, you had there was an insurance man, sort of like a mailman. You know, he Correct. came to the house with a book and, you know, and um, you know, collected premiums and stuff like that. You know, so you saw people like that. You saw, you know, police officers. If you went downtown, uh, you saw whites. And when you went to school, you know, uh, you know, a good number of, uh, of teachers were whites. Um, but sort of like uh, I, I think I heard Dick Gregory say it once, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, you, I saw so few white people that, you know, I, I grew up, you know, thinking and actually feeling, you know, the world was, you know, 90 percent black. Um, so that's how that's how segregated uh, the, 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 the neighborhoods were. And, and there were a few whites. I remember when I was very young, you know, there was there was still a, you know, a, a smattering of whites left in the neighborhood. But by the time I became a teenager, 95, 97 percent of them had had, had left. Um, mm. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a very uh, it was a very segregated uh, uh, city. Um, but 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 as but as I said, as a young child growing up, um, I didn't sort of feel that kind of segregation because my world was defined by. Um, you know the, the the community in which I lived, and as a as a, as a young person, um, you know the reality of 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 where I was going to school, who I was hanging out with, how safe I would be or not, that was sort of more immediate than issues of uh, of, of 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 race and racial confrontation. Uh, um, I really became much more aware of that as I got <clears throat> as I got older Certainly. and um, sort of uh, uh, moved uh, uh, beyond the confines of my neighborhood. I think that one of the things that sort of did inform me, maybe um, maybe in aspects of my personality, is that in in our uh, neighborhood we had the 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 misfortune, um, and I'm not sure if that's the right word to, to use, but um, our gang territory, um, and I was very active. I don't want to put on any goody two-shoes uh, sort of... Uh, no, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to the guys here. I mean, I was, I was, I was an active member um, in, that, in that culture, but one of the misfortunes that we had is that in our whole gang territory, I mean, we had a large area, geographically speaking, uh-huh. But we only had elementary schools in our entire uh, gang territory. <laughs> so that meant that um, for junior high school, and there wasn't middle school then, back when I was a kid, you had elementary school, junior high school, which was junior high school was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, and then you went to high school, um, right. which was 10th, 11th, and 12th. But we had elementary schools, but zero junior high schools and zero high schools in our gang territory. So okay. that meant that we had to go outside of our territory to go to junior high school and to go to high school. Uh. Um, and that, in a sense, you know, reinforced the camaraderie and the meaning of being um, sort of uh, now in my sort of sophisticated academic mindset, I would call, you know, communitarian in, in, in one's orientation. I mean, you couldn't, you don't, you don't. I knew guys who probably would have ended up in the NBA or the NFL whose, whose careers never saw the light of day because we did not enjoy the luxury of being able to stay after school for basketball practice or football practice. Because you had to um, leave right after school ended? 
Yeah, as we you roll in with the homies, yeah. and you roll out with the homies, or you right. may not roll at all. Um, so that was a part of my my reality. Um, I had an older brother, um, who um, was um, how can we put it? Um, we don't want to be too. Uh, when I'm going exposed too much. Anyway. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I had an older brother who was really, um, um, how, how can we put it, prominent uh, right. in, 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 in our gang. And uh, um, my father uh, was really quite, um, uh, he was a devoted father. Um, and um, in fact, I mean, one of his achievements, you know, I was in a family of five boys in urban, urban Philadelphia um, during the, what we used to call the, the gang war era. Um, and all of my brothers survived and none of us went to prison. That was an enormous, uh, an enormous uh, accomplishment for my father. And uh, he was quite, uh, quite strict. So my brother, um, as we said, as I said, you know, we went outside of our turf to go to go to high school. And, you know, he got in his share of trouble. And my father said that, you know, if you go to this high school and you get, you know, you start getting in the same trouble, you know, you, there's going to be trouble with me. So I ended up going uh, to what is called a vocational technical high school, which was very, very far uh, out of uh, out of my um, out of our, our out of our territory. I had to take two trains and a and a bus to get to school. Uh, every day. Um, and again, this was still in the, you know, in the gang war era. So, I mean, I went, you know, four times the distance from home that my older brother had gone from home just to go to high school. But what that did was it put me in a, in a situation where, you know, I, I became very used to venturing out on my own and making alliances, you know, meeting people um, almost as a survival mechanism. Um, so I've always, uh, been, um, I won't say comfortable, but the, the prospect of having to, um, sort of forge into, to new territory, um, by myself, um, was one that I, I sort of got used to, um, as part of, of, of the reality of, <clears throat> of, you know, surviving in my in my childhood. So by the time I got to to college, I mean, I I can count on half a hand, um, you know, the, the the number of of of, of whites that were, that were in classes that I took. I mean, I was you know, this was just a continuation sort of of my high school experience where I was I just had to venture out on my own and had to you know find the the, the survival mechanisms, um, the 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 fortitude. Um, you know, the determination, you know, to survive and, 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 and you know, forge ahead. Right. Um, and that, that sort of goes back to my, to my, my childhood. Mm -hmm. So did you, so like when you, again, like you, we, when you go to that vocational school at the technical yeah, high school, you I, said. I remember when I, I got right. to the University of Texas, uh, there was a, a colleague I had. And, and we, what we had in common was that we, we both were graduates graduates of, of the University of Pennsylvania, and we were sitting around his living room one day just talking about our, our childhood uh, upbringing. And he said to me, you know, I don't know if you realize it, but I can probably, I can probably count on, um, on one hand the number of people who went. No, I can probably put in a phone booth of the number of people who went to a, voc a vocational technical high school right. uh, and ended up graduating uh, with a degree from the Ivy League. Seriously. Um, Right. That's um, that was my question. Or that uh, that's what I was trying to lead to. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, for people don't know it. I, I mean, vocational technical high school. See, my my, my father, uh, you know, comes from a generation um, when uh, my father went to the fifth grade, um, and you know, he grew up in you know industrial America, and of course, you know, had to deal. He grew up in the South, you know, like many parents in the North. Um, when he was 18, um, he just picked up, um, um, left South Carolina and then came to Philadelphia. I think he said with about $50 in his pocket and just made a new life. Um, but, wow. um, he, he was very, very keen on education for his, his boys. And for him, education was graduating from high school because that was sort of, 
you know, the forbidden fruit that he never had the the opportunity uh, to have. Um, and he saw that as, um, you know, his 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 apex duty as a father to make sure that his children, you know, graduated with a with a, with a high school degree. Um, and vocational technical schools were sort of this innovation that said, you know. You know, there's a line in, in the autobiography of Malcolm X where he talks about, you know, wanting to be a lawyer, and the teacher tells him, well, you know, that's sort of an unrealistic uh, aspiration for you. You know, you should really perhaps think about being a carpenter or something like that. So the idea was that, you know, these kids are not likely to, you know, to be able to do very much with their minds, so let's teach them how to make a living with their hands. And so these were schools that were really designed to train blue-collar, uh, urban, inner-city inner city, uh, uh, poor black kids. And at that time, I and mean, we were still in a in a in an industrial uh, I don't want to call it an industrial age, but maybe an industrial age. Um, you know, the, the the job finding prospects were not were not were not bad. Um, right. I I went to a vocational technical high school. I I studied, or I majored in instrumentation. I got my first job at uh, Westinghouse. I was 18 years old, and at that time they had a had a program where you could you could leave high school for your second semester and carry all of your grades from your first semester into your second semester and then graduate while working. So I went to work for Westinghouse Corporation. And um, just to give you an idea of, of, of how this worked, and I left Westinghouse in 1979, 1979, because my first year of college, I started college in 1978. Um, and I worked full time my first year of college, um, because my parents couldn't afford to, um, you know, pay for college. So I worked my first year full time and then I decided I, uh, you know, I couldn't do that anymore. Um, and I had some savings. So I went my second year and then after that, I, I, I ended up on scholarships. Um, um, but, but. But the, the, the vocational uh, technical school produced the following. When I left Westinghouse in 1979, my hourly, my hourly uh, not salary, my hourly rate uh, was $9.71 an hour. This is in 1979 with just a, uh, you know, a high, school, uh, a high school diploma. And this was a job with, you know, full benefits, uh, medical, vacation, the whole nine. I mean, this was sort of a, a you know, a blue collar career. Um, but at the time, I mean, I think I was just beginning to come of sort of, quote unquote, intellectual age. And um, I could just feel a billion brain cells dying every day. And then I went into work and I decided that um, I, this is not what I wanted to do with my life. And this was around the time that. Um, I, you know, began my, 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 my search for uh, sort of genuine anchoring um, in life. And so I, uh, I became a Muslim around 1978. Um, and so this was a time of, you know, really getting serious, making some real serious life decisions. Um, and so all these things sort of coincided. So I ended up um, sort of... Uh, getting serious about college, getting serious about the future, um, quitting Westinghouse, I moved back home, um, and uh, that was sort of uh, the beginning of the next phase of my life. Well, and, and to that end, I would love if you could talk about your, your own uh, academic advancement. I mean, uh, getting into an Ivy League school and, uh, you know, UPenn, et cetera, I'd love to, what, what was the, the process uh, in, in yeah. transitioning that? You know, a, a lot of people find that sort of sort of strange, and I think that that has a lot to do, if if I might be permitted to say so, I think mean, that just has a lot to do about certain stereotypes about about poor blacks in the ghetto. Um, I can say with all honesty, with no hesitation, um, with no uh, exaggeration, um, that I know for a fact that you know. I left behind in Philadelphia guys who I hung out with. I mean, homeboys who were, you know, gang worn with me and, and, and doing all kinds of other things um, who were smarter than me. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I think I think one of the real uh, differentiating factors in my case was was my father. 
Um, huh. Because my father was, uh, you know, he was old school. And um, he was uh, he was a disciplinarian. He was um, he was not in any way um, he was not abusive. But when you did something you had no business doing, um, you know, you paid the piper. And again, as I said, he went to the fifth grade and his burning obsession. Um, there were two things uh, in in our household that my that would send my father to the roof. One was fighting um, among ourselves. Uh, my father would not tolerate uh, our fighting among ourselves. Um, you know, that was that was just a no, no. Um, 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 you know, bickering and stuff like that. Yeah. But like physical fighting, he just no, no, that's a no, no. The second um, no, no um, was getting a bad report card, period. He just didn't play that. Um, again, he had been denied himself, you know, the opportunity to even get beyond elementary school. And, uh, you know, he always um, he always suspected that had he had that opportunity, his life would have been very, very, very different. Um, because my father, and I can tell you now, I know a little bit about intelligence. My father was an intelligent man. He just wasn't educated. Sure. Um, so... Uh, he insisted that, you know, school was important. And at that time, you know, um, report cards were you got two grades for every subject. You got a, uh, a grade in the, uh, the subject itself, and then you got a grade for behavior, right? And my father would always compare the subject grade with the behavior grade. So if you got a C or a D in the subject, you better get an A in the behavior because if the subject okay. seemed to be affected by the behavior, you want to pay the price. Um, okay. So I, I think that the, 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 the differentiating factor between me and a lot of guys, you know, in the neighborhood I grew up with was my father and the fact that, you know, he would just not, he would not relent on the, the idea that you must go to school if you can't understand the math or the science or whatever, you can sit there and behave. But he made it very clear that our lives mattered and that he was not going to abdicate his responsibility as our father um, to the end of allowing us to forfeit the opportunity to get something that he never had a chance to get. So I was always um, I was never permitted just to blow school off like other right you know, guys in my, in my neighborhood were, I, I was just never were, was permitted to do that. Now I could do all the other things. I mean, I hung out, you know, I gang ward, I did every, all the other things that everybody else did, but I knew I was coming home to a father who had, who had certain expectations and, you know, you know, a, a, a decent report card was always won. Um, so I, you know, I, 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 I had enough sort of, um, to get into college. Um, I remember my mother taking me down to the University of Pennsylvania to take the SATs. Um, and, um, I mean, it was her idea, if, if, I, if I remember correctly, because I, I wasn't really interested in going to college. I didn't start college until I was 22 years old. I mean, when I graduated from high school, I had no real interest in, in, in going to college. And, you know, that, that interest sort of developed subsequently once I st started working because I wanted to retire by the time I was, well, I started working at 18. I wanted to retire by the time I was 21. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, 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 but getting back to your question, um, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I, I think what really sustained me was that I, I, I didn't think that I would get into college. Um, I first uh, went to Temple University uh, in, in Philadelphia. Um, and I remember talking to the guy on the phone in the admissions office, and he said, okay, we're going to admit you. And I was just elated. So I went to Temple, and then two years later, I transferred to the University of Pennsylvania because by that time, I started out, my major was accounting. I wanted to be an accountant, you know, make a lot of money, uh, wear a suit and all that stuff, you know. Um, but I found it 
both boring. Um, and then I hit those reversing entries, which just took me for a loop. I couldn't understand <laughs> reversing entries in accounting. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, so I, you know, I changed majors. I was a religion major for a little while. And then, um, at that time, Temple University had this program, uh, uh, Professor Ismail Al-Faruqi, rahimahullah, was at Temple. And he had made an arrangement with the University of Pennsylvania, uh, whereby Temple students could go to Penn to study Arabic in exchange for Penn students being allowed to come to Temple and take courses with Faruqi because he was recognized as, That's right. you know, uh, you know, an eminent uh, Islamicist at that time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, this is, as I said before, you know, around the time that I, uh, that I uh, converted to Islam and I, I, I wanted to learn Arabic. And, and part of that was, you know, really related to the sort of the, the, the state of the, the, the community at the time. I mean, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, like I said, I mean, I, 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 I came from, you know, the, the tough streets of Philadelphia. And I don't, I don't want to exaggerate that. Um, you know, lots of guys who sort of, quote unquote, make it out of the ghetto, they, you know, they like to turn themselves into these great, bigger than life sort of, you know, gangsters. Um, um, I wasn't that. I, I, I held my own. And, you know, my homeboys would rather have me there than not there. But, um, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't crazy. Um, 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 some of my homeboys, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't one of uh, I wasn't one of them. But anyway, I mean, that's where I came from. And when I came into Islam, you know, I would come into the to the to the masjid, and there would be people um, who, you know, in my jahiliya day, would barely be able to walk on the same side of the street with me, and then they were dictating to me, you know, how I should live my life because now I'm a Muslim, you know. Um, right. And I said, no way, um, this is not going to work for me. Um, you know, these people want to drive me out of here. So that really gave me a an incentive, you know, to, 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 to learn Islam on my own. And I, from there, I really wanted to learn it for myself because, you know, I, I just did not have confidence that, you know, um, people who now felt that the fact that, you know, we both were Muslims entitled them to, to dictate to me, um, you know, how I would live my life. Um, that was just not, that wasn't working for me. So I, I really decided that I wanted to learn this on my own. So one of the first steps was learning Arabic. And that's when I uh, started going over to the University of Pennsylvania um, to study Arabic. And then, um, you know, I liked it. I, I really liked it. And so I decided, well, why not just, you know, um, and I'd heard about this, uh, you know, they had a, an actual Near Eastern Studies program. A uh, whole department at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and I'd heard about this uh, this professor George Moctesi and you know all this stuff, and so I decided you know well let me I, I might as well just transfer to Penn and you know major in Islamic studies and uh, you know um, you know make a go of it. Um, so so that's what I did. So I spent two years at Temple and then I transferred to the University of Pennsylvania. And that's where I ended up getting my PhD. Mm, mm. But but the point that I want to make is that you know there are lots of 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 blacks in in ghetto circumstances um, who are extremely intelligent. They're not educated, um, but but extremely intelligent. And you know I graduated, and you know my undergraduate degree, degree from Penn was 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 with honors. And I can tell you that. You know, I, I can pick out homeboys that I hung out with that I'm sure had they gotten the opportunity that they would uh, they would have graduated with honors as well. So it doesn't it's not as 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 odd or strange to me that, you know, a young black kid from the ghettos of Philadelphia, you know, would end up in the Ivy League and, and, and performing well. Um, I mean, I just think that some of these guys just didn't have some of the guidance and some of the some of the incentives uh, that I had, such as my father. 
Mm-hmm. And then I think, quite frankly, to be totally honest about it, Islam really did make a very fundamental difference in that regard because it imbued me with a sense of mission um, and seriousness. Um, and then, as I said, I, you know, I didn't start college until I was 22. And that was a good thing, actually, for me, because I don't know if I would have been ready for it at 18. And I, I still see kids today who are not really ready for college at 18. Right. Right. Um, I think I think but, that was kind of like the or at least what I was wondering as well. And I think Zucky's question being informed by because it seemed like you're you, like where you were headed in terms of your trajectory, you know, coming out of a vocational school was not a, a, a career in academia, per se. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Or or, or in, and, and, and so how that sort of shifted and, and, and how your interest shifted. Uh, and so now I think now you're kind of talking about how perhaps. You know, not only your background and and your father being a disciplinarian, but also, you know, your own uh, conversion to Islam and the in the role that played in that in that growth as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, do you, I guess without sort of belaboring or or, or uh, like the uh, what is it uh, bearing the lead here? Um, uh, <laughs> what what sort of drove you to Islam, or or or, or in, initially was the point of interest there? Was it, a, was it social factors, sort of more religious, theological? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that you can really uh, – I don't know if you can really um, separate all those things out. Mm-hmm. Um, and let me just say um, up front that I am personally not very much swayed by conversion stories. Um, I tend to think that, I mean, they're interesting, don't get me wrong, um, but I tend to think that sometimes they are sort of post-facto rationalizations of, you know, a series of uh, engagements, e- events, e- epiphanies that are not uh, sort of rationally stacked in a manner that they would logically lead to any particular conclusion. Mm. Um I I I grew up uh, in uh, in, a, in a household that was not religious in the sense of my parents sort of um, maintaining any kind of catechism in the in in, in the home, mm. um, but we went to church when I was a young child. And, uh, you know, we all, you know, participated in the Easter program. You know, you, at that time you had to uh, do a little performance for the Easter program. Uh, it's called, you, you had to memorize, uh, you know, some, some verses from the Bible or, or some kind of religious poem or something like that and, and perform it in front of the congregation. We all did that. Um, mm. it's, it's called Say Your Peace. Um, and, uh, you know, my mother was, and, and still is, uh, very religious. Um, my father, um, uh, had developed a very cynical, uh, attitude towards, uh, towards the church and, and, and towards religion, mm. but he was not anti-religion. He just, uh, felt that it was practiced in a way that was, uh, so hypocritical that, it, uh, it it turned him into a turned him into a cynic. Right. Um, myself, um, I I never recall um, being inclined towards any kind of atheism um, in my in my life. Even during the times, I mean, um, you know, we gang banging like crazy, man. You know, um, and um, still, I mean. Uh, I, you know, the idea of my, my own, um, I mean, this is, again, post facto rationalization. I mean, I mean, but the yeah. idea of my own contingency. Now, of course, I mean, at, you know, 13, 14 years old, I mean, who, who, who even knows what contingency is, right? I mean, so, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I can only think of it in those terms in retrospect, but I, I, never, <clears throat> I never had a problem with the idea uh, of God. Mm-hmm. But I always basically believed in God. Um, but I never really found outlets for expressing that in a manner that seemed to be consistent with the sort of 
individual and cultural profile that was me. Um, being a Christian um, just wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't cool. It wasn't uh, masculine enough. Um, it didn't seem to be serious enough. Um, 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 and at that time, you know, again, this is mid seventies, you know, the nation of Islam was really, really making its bid. Um, I was never a member of the nation of Islam. Um, one of the, uh, one of the things that sort of uh, impeded my inclination towards the nation was that I, I always knew that this sort of race based religiosity, um, you know, it might be, uh, uh, it might, it might have a lot of utility in, in this or that particular context, but I, I never accepted it as true. So I was, I was influenced by, you know, sort of the general atmosphere that, 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 that the nation had spawned. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I never, I never, I never, was inclined to be a member of the nation. And I think that in retrospect, I mean, people have to recognize that, you know, the nation did spawn a sort of atmospheric change. Mm -hmm. um, they really did redefine, you know, black American culture. You know, they rearranged the furniture in um, the black American mind um, during the 1960s and 70s. I mean, you know, as I've written, I, I really do feel that, I mean, not just as an academic, but as someone who actually lived that history, that they did do a lot to redefine black cultural orthodoxy. And we were all a part of that in Philadelphia. Um, so when I was about mm, 20 or so, 21, um, because uh, after I... Uh, uh, went to work for Westinghouse. Um, I also left and went into the military for a couple of years and then came back out. And by that time, um, I was really searching for, uh, as I said, you know, some, some spiritual anchoring, um, mm -hmm. you know, some existential anchoring. Um, because I was, I wasn't afraid, you know, lots of people say, you know, religion is this crutch, this, that, and the other. I, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid uh, other than, you know, the idea of, you know, well, you know, there is, this can all be just, you know, live, eat, have sex, you know, go to the club, you know, and just die. I mean, right. it's got to be more than that. It's got to be more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I set out on a, on a spiritual trek and to be quite frank and honest, um, I knew that the sort of religious apathy that I had lived by up to that point um, had to end. But I did not know that, that Islam would be the expression through which that would happen. Um, it could have been, you know, Buddhism. It could have been, you know, I don't know, you know, New World Spirituality or something like that. Um, but I think that what did make the difference was that, you know, I, I met some people. Mm. who happened to be uh, Muslims and uh, people who um, um, I respected for, um, for what their conversion had to represent. And I remember if, if, if anything was a um, sort of tipping point in this uh Conversion to Islam. I, I, there was one night in particular that I, I, I remember, um, and uh, we were standing on the corner. Uh, you got to remember, I wasn't a Muslim at this point, right? Um, and we were standing on the corner, group of us, um, you know, watching girls, you know, jump into the swimming pool and stuff like that. And there was one guy there um, who I knew. He was older than me. And he was, um, as we would put it back in the day, he was showing up gangster. And so we were standing there, you know, shooting the crap, you know, these kinds of conversations that just, you know, sort of roam aimlessly. Right. And I noticed one thing about him, which was that 
he wasn't using any profanity. And this was completely out of place for that kind of setting and for somebody of his profile. So I'm standing there, okay, all right, this is interesting. And then I noticed somebody would, you know, pass him um, the wine bottle and he would say, no thanks. Nothing judgmental, no, you know, no attitude, just a very confident, no thanks. And somebody pass him a joint, no thanks. And I'm looking at this guy, man, because I knew him. Um, okay. And I knew who he was. Um, I mean, he'd been in and out of prison a couple of times. I knew this guy. And I'm like looking at this guy and I'm saying, what is going on with him? Um, and uh, he had clearly found a way of expressing his own sort of religious, moral, and spiritual commitments in a context where they would have seemed out of place. But he had found the, 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 the packaging within which that could be affected. And I was very moved by that. And so I remember, like, after we began to sort of disperse, I remember sort of, you know, edging over into him and, you know, asking him basically, you know, yeah. what's up? Right. And he told me that he, he said, well, you know, I'm an Orthodox Muslim. Mm. Right. And at that time, um, the distinction Orthodox meant that you were not with the nation. Part, that right. meant you he said, right. I'm an Orthodox Muslim. I said, oh, yeah. And uh, so uh, he was working at a barbershop at that time. So, you know, I walked him back to the barbershop and he was telling me about it. And then he went to the barbershop and he came out and gave me a little, little small booklet. I still remember it was this green cover towards understanding Islam by Maldudi. Um, and he said, you know, you might want to take a look at this. And, uh, you know, if you want, you know, I'll take it down to the mosque sometime and et cetera, et cetera. And I remember um, taking that book home and, 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 and reading it. Um, and that was really the beginning of, of, of a real transformation um, for me personally. Right. Um, but it was more of a matter of finding the packaging, um, the, the, the cultural, personal sort of expression uh, of, 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 of religiosity um, in which I could feel like I could stay within my own skin. It wasn't some, oh, I discovered God. I had always believed in God. That was, that was never a problem to me. The problem was how does one live a life of religious commitment um, and at the same time not lose um, the ability uh, to sustain one's profile as oneself. Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, not become a, a weirdo, uh, you know, um, you know, some, some kind of outcast or something like that. Um, so um, that was the beginning of, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the move to Islam for me. And then, as I said, once I came into uh, the Muslim community, um, I, I very quickly became aware of, you know, the need to, to, to deepen this understanding and to learn it for myself. Right. Um, and that was the beginning of that. Now, Dr. Uh, Professor Jackson, you know, it, it, being in the East Coast, uh, and again, like my history might be a little rust, but I mean, in the late 60s, you have the, you know, the Islam movement that sort mm -hmm. of grows out of uh, Imam um, Dawood Faisal's community, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, was that sort of a distinct community as the nation was, or was it were they integrated into quote unquote as you as you said Orthodox Muslim or Orthodox Muslim communities? Well, at the time, I didn't know it, but uh -huh. yes, I mean um, the Dawood Islam was actually quite uh, uh, what's the word I want to use here. Um, it was quite influential in, 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 in the Philadelphia community. And in fact, I didn't know it at the time, um, but one of the, the leading institutions was the Islamic Center uh, of Philadelphia, which was down on Broad Street. And uh, I only learned this subsequently. The Islamic Center of Philadelphia uh, had moved um, from uh, 19th Street in Philadelphia, uh, Masjid Mujahideen. That was a Dalal Islam uh, mosque. 
um, it had fissured a bit, and a faction had gone on to establish the Islamic Center of Philadelphia. They, by that time, had shed some of the Darul Islam ethos. Okay. And was very much, um, you know, inclining toward a more sort of mainstream, um, almost gentrifying version of Islam in black America. Um, but that's actually where I, I, uh, I profess my shahada. That's where I took my shahada, on uh, the Islamic Center of Broad Street. So it was, it had Darul Islam uh, roots. Roots, right, yeah. right. Which yeah. itself and, grows and out of New York. They were very right. distinct from uh-huh. the nation. There was no right. cross-fertilization between right. those, those movements. Right, right. And I think it grows out of Brooklyn and is formed by not yeah, only yeah. the uh, the Islam, what is it, the Islamic Mission? Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the Islamic it, Mission of America, as well as the uh, the, the, the famous sort of state uh, State Street state mosque. mosque. Yeah. Yeah. Which was immigrant based, I think. Which was not like a like a. Predominantly, well, American. yeah, but the dar, but the dar itself, uh, uh-huh. you know, broke off of that, in in, in part, you know, uh, you, you know, we, we tend to talk about these movements, in, you know, you know, in a single stroke, but there was variation, and I think that, I mean, the dar didn't have a sort of militant uh, ethos to it, uh, and that's part of what. The Islamic Center of Philadelphia um, had thrown off. It had thrown off sort of that 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 that, that militant ethos, right. uh, and it was looking to itself as being bo- both more more international and more mainstream American. Got it. Um, and I still remember the Imam down there, who was a very charismatic figure, um, uh, um, who really sort of steered uh, steered the ship. Um, toward a more sort of a, a mainstream, but but very definitely Sunni right. um, expression of Islam uh, in, in 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 Black America, and I think that one of the things that um, was very impressive about this community, you know, <laughs> it was at the uh, Islamic Center of uh, Philadelphia that I first met uh, Dr. Omar Abdullah. Wow. Um, he was uh, he was at the time uh-huh. uh, he was a professor at Temple University, and he would come down to the Islamic Center to teach classes. And I remember sitting in one of those you know sort of early classes you know just to learn Islam uh, by Doctor uh, uh, Doctor Omar uh, Doctor Omar Fouad Abdullah, uh, and um, this was, again, part of the sort of, quote-unquote, almost uh, mainstreaming uh, of this particular faction of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Dar. Of, yeah. Although it was not exclusive, and you did have um, other members who brought more of the Dar influence along with them. So it was something of a hodgepodge, but I think that um, the imam at the time, um, who was a very charismatic and, and, and forceful figure, um, you know, was very uh, uh, intentional in, in what he was trying to do um, with uh, with the movement. Now, is this also where you encounter Dr. Ismail Farouki? Uh, yes. Is he is yes. he very active in the community? Ismail Farouki, <laughs> rahimahullah, was was um, was a very interesting figure. And in, in, in retrospect, I mean, I didn't recognize it at the time, but I do now that you know um, Farouki was one of those in individuals who had, I mean, he had this academic profile and he had this international uh, network of, of, of connections, um, some of them in some rather very high places, and yet Furuki would take the time. I mean, he, in fact, he, he seemed to see it as, as a duty, um, you know, to, to, to come down and, and, and speak at places like the Islamic Center. Um, you know, he would be a part of uh, you know, uh, not conferences, but 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 you know, lecture series that brought mm-hmm. together various uh, parts and factions of the community. Um, you know, he really did. You know, to a limited extent, obviously, given his his, his profile. But I, I I I did recognize. You know, he he he. 
he felt a certain um, affinity towards the community and a certain, I, I think, sense of um, obligation toward the community. And he did what he could do to to fulfill that sense of obligation. So yeah, I, I met um, um, Dr. Faruqi uh, mm. through this connection with the Islamic Center, uh, okay. Omar Abdullah, right. uh, another... Who himself was a student of perhaps another leading figure as in Muslim figure, figure in academia, that being uh, Dr. Fazl Rahman. Mm-hmm. Yes, at that. the University of Chicago. Yeah, yeah. I find that fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so because they represent now, that well, history that uh, of uh, Muslim, you know, mu- like Muslims in you know in academia teaching Islamic studies. Yeah, but I, I didn't recognize any of that history at the time, and quite right. frankly, I did not. Um, at that time, I, I wasn't really yet on my way to becoming an academic myself. Right. Okay. Um, this happens during undergraduate, then. Yeah, late undergraduate. I think that it was. <laughs> It wasn't very long right. um, before it finally dawned on me that, you know, you're not going to do very much with a bachelor's degree in Near Eastern Studies. So you're going to have to double down and take this the take this right. the distance. Otherwise, this is going to end up to be, uh, you know, just a royal waste of time. So I want to circle back and, and go back to something that you know, and pick up there, which is uh, so now you then um, uh, transfer over to the University of, uh, of, of uh, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. You uh, are now a student of uh, Professor George McDesey, who himself is a just a leading figure in, a, in, in sort of uh, in academia. Um, is that through his uh, mentorship uh, leads you to. Uh, your interest in, in, in pursuing studies in um, Islamic law and theology and the writings of uh, um, I don't know. Look, when I when I went to Penn, I was an undergraduate still. So, right. in fact, I'm not sure. I can't really recall taking undergraduate classes with 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 professor mctasy um, um i may have but they they they're not a vivid memory for me okay. um so it was um well yes no maybe i did when i was a, when i was a senior i took a couple of those you know undergraduate graduate classes you know the the 400 level um but then i this uh it was roger allen who actually um um, asked me um, if I was interested in pursuing a graduate degree. Um, and to be quite honest, when he first broached that topic to me, it sort of scared me. I didn't know if I was ready. Um, and I said yes. Um, and so, you know, I went through all of, you know, the, the requirements for that. And I ended up getting accepted into the graduate program. And it was as a graduate student that I really came into this relationship uh, with uh, with Professor Mukdesi, and um, his inspiration was not so much in the direction of this particular pursuit, i.e., Islamic law or theology or whatever. Although he did inspire in that in that in that in that vein by by the way he was able to make this scholarship just pop out of the books. I mean, he was a very um, vivid writer. Um, he was able just to make this stuff come alive. And in fact, I, I think that his articles, uh, Ash'ari and the Ash'arites, are, are just classics um, in, in, that, in that regard. But I think more inspiring, Matasi was very... Uh, intent on making sure that Islamic studies was grounded in a very deep and fundamental facility, mastery, at homeness with the sources, the Arabic sources Mm -hmm. uh, of Islamic studies. And he used to tell us, you know, this is what's going to separate the men from the boys in this field. Right. A mastery Um, of the language. And and he used to, you know, he used to, 
he used to tell us, you know, you go get, you know, a couple of these books written by some people you think are big shots, and then you go to the bibliography and you'll see all this French and German, and then the Arabic will be, you know, third or fourth um, in terms of priority. This is not the way to do Islamic studies. You have to be in a position where you can follow the sources wherever they take you. And he was very, very, very big um, in that regard. And so his real inspiration was in establishing a standard uh, by which um, one was to pursue uh, Islamic, Islamic studies. And that meant um, <clears throat> being very well-rounded in it. So in his curriculum, we didn't just study history and law and theology. Um, we studied literature as well. You had to do from Ibn al-Qais up to Adunis, um, and, and I mean in Arabic. Right. Um, we had seminars on this stuff, right. um, Arabic grammar, the, the, the whole nine. So his, his real imprint was, again, on ensuring that as a scholar of Islam, you were in a position to allow the sources of Islam as a civilization to speak for themselves, as opposed to superimposing um, upon these sources all kinds of presuppositions, um, um, attitudes, assumptions um, that come from without. Right, wow. right. Um, now, you uh, do you spend some time overseas also studying language yeah, at this yeah. point? Yeah, I mean, um, as I said, I mean, you know, when I when I when I first. Uh, came into Islam, it just became clear to me that I wanted to learn it for myself. So what I did was, I mean, when I um, finished my undergraduate degree, I went to, uh, to Egypt. I was a, um, a fellow in the Center for Arabic Study Abroad program. Mm -hmm. So I went there. And by that time, um, you know, I, Arabic was <laughs> sort of like everything to me. So I really immersed myself in this whole Arabic business. So by the time I, I went to CASA, my first was not was not bad. Um, and I went to Cairo um, as a fellow, stayed there for a year. And it was then that I really be, I came in contact with, uh, uh, you know, the traditional scholars, right. um, and began that began that track. Right. Um, I came back a year later um, to the University of Pennsylvania to continue my graduate mm -hmm. study, and then. A few years after that, I went back to Egypt, this time as executive director for the Center of Arabic Study Abroad. The CASA and, program, right? Which you yeah, mentioned. and at yeah. that time, it um, was at that time that I was really actually able um, to pin down, um, you know, a sheikh and start you know, studying um, manically fit in theology and, and, and other things like that. Um, and I did that for the next mm, two going on three years. Um alongside all the other things that I had to do. And then I came back. Um, when I first came back to the United States, I didn't come back to the University of Pennsylvania. I came back to my first job at the uh, University of Texas. It was there that I had to finish my, uh, finish my dissertation. Um, oh. And then I, you know, went on to... Uh, Indiana after Texas, right? Yeah, then I went from, from Texas yeah. to Indiana, and then from That's Indiana right. to... Uh, to Wayne State for a year, and then from yeah. Wayne State uh, to the University of Michigan, and that was in 1997. I still remember that year because that year was the was the, the, the year that uh, U of M went 14 and 0, and they won the championship in football. So you started at <laughs> University of Michigan in 1997. Yes. Okay. Okay. Because where you come on my radar is when I'm an undergraduate at the university. So, and I, and I remember you being at the University of Austin at the time, or sorry, yeah. Texas in Austin yes, at I was, the time. I was at Texas from yeah. 1989, I think it was, to 1992. Uh -huh. Okay, that, which makes total sense, right, right. Uh, many of my older cousins even who attended U UT uh, took classes with you. And so, yeah, that's when I first began to hear about Professor Jackson. So um, anyway, so fascinating so far. Uh, uh, and, and for those, just, just for the listening audience, you know, you, you mentioned Fusha, that's classical Arabic. Uh, you mentioned CASA, which is the Center for Arabic uh, Studies Abroad, which remains, and certainly at the time when you were a fellow as well as the executive director, sort of the premier, uh, 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 you know, study abroad of Arabic, uh, you know, uh, program offered mm -hmm. to 
uh, students um, in the United States as well as, um, you know, in the Western world. Um, so now you are at the University of Michigan. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention at the outset um, uh, is that you have now published a number of, 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 of uh, obviously, articles, but, but as well as uh, uh, books. Um, you know, we begin with uh, 1996, the Islamic law in the state, uh, the writings of Shihab al al-Qarafi. Um, and then in 2002, uh, you do a translation and a commentary of a piece uh, by Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I mean, I can go through just sort of listing all of your uh, numerous publications. Uh, 2005, Islam in the Black American. 2009, Islam and the Problem of Black Suffering. Um, and then more, and some of the more recent works, which we will get to. Um, but, I, you know, I, I want to say, so in terms of a lot of your writings, um, it seems that, you know, if we could put them in sort of two large buckets of, again, dealing with Muslim intellectual history, certainly, but primarily uh, in, in, within the rubrics of Islamic law and, and, and Islamic theology. Mm-hmm. Uh, because even, especially, I would argue, like not only your book on Ghazali, but also your book on Islam in the Black American, Islam in the Black, and the Problem of Black Suffering, uh, focus on the issue of theology. Mm-hmm. Um, could you talk a little bit about, and I know this sort of begins, I, I know one of the starting points of both your conversation uh, on Islamic law as well as Islamic theology is, is from this notion of um, both Islamic law and Islamic theology being negotiated constructs. Mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that and how that now we can sort of begin to tie a lot of our conversation now moving forward into sort of, you know, some of the challenges that confront the Muslim community today here in the United yeah. States? I mean, in, 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 a, in, a, in a real sense, I don't see how Islamic law, um, and uh, to, to a different extent, but also yeah. Islamic theology, I don't see how they could not be negotiated constructs. Hmm. Um, I mean, my, my emphasis, I shouldn't say emphasis, but my, my um, you know, it was, it was after I came back from from overseas i think that one of the things that really did dawn upon me you know studying overseas was the extent to which um what i was studying would Mm -hmm. really require a a a a real heavy um project of, of 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 translation um um there were historical, uh, factual, um, even in some ways epistemological assumptions um, that were perfectly fine in their own context, um, but that would simply not have very much application in an American context. And I remember, you know, um, just thinking to myself, you know, when I was studying some of these things, you know, how one would have to seek to translate this stuff into um, a, a a form that would render it effective in addressing American American reality, and um, so after I published my first book, which was um, Islam and the Problem, I'm sorry, uh, Islamic Law in the State, um, it wasn't long after that that I began to really become interested in this whole business of placing. Mm-hmm. Um, the classical tradition into conversation with um, real contemporary um, American reality, and from my own perspective, most especially um, the reality of Islam in Black America. Um, right. And um, I mean, I, I don't find that idea to be all that all that revolutionary, and I'm a bit surprised sometimes when people, you know, sort of, you know, see it as such. Um, but in a real sense, I don't see that as entailing anything different from what um, those classical or them themselves uh, did. Right. Um, but I think at the same time, you would appreciate the fact that although it might not seem revolutionary, uh, you know, certainly to a lot of, for example, Americans, non-Muslims, who, who, who know who, their interaction or what they know about Islamic law or Islam in general is not this idea of a 
uh, of a uh, negotiated construct, but rather, you know, it's just dictates from above and, you know, quote unquote, you know, Sharia and divine law and the yeah, but I, you know, I, quite frankly, I think a and lot of that even Muslims, yeah. hmm? even Muslims, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, yeah. I, I, that I, way. I, think, I think quite frankly, I think a lot of that has to do with certain assumptions that we have about religion that come out of the European past. Thank you. We, 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 we assume, you know, when we say religion, um, well, most of the time we're talking about a very concrete, specific experience of Christianity in the world, and we simply assume that that has universal application to all religion in all places and all time. Um, and, you know, given the hegemonic deployment of, our, you know, some of the major uh, sort of uh, facets of, of, of modern thought, you know, some of these assumptions have seeped into the Muslim contents as well. And so, yeah, they too send, tend to think that, um, you know, th- you know that, 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 that interpretation is, is blurred with revelation. Right. That, you know, we don't see the difference between accepting the Qur'an on the one hand, just as an example, and accepting this or that particular interpretation um, of the Qur'an on the other. And sometimes it's very difficult for people um, to to differentiate between to differentiate between the two, but from my perspective, again, you know, having studied Islamic intellectual history, um, what I'm trying to do today, and this is not a it's not an apology, it's just my perspective on the issue, oh. it's not different from what Muslim intellectuals have been doing virtually from from the beginning, and that is, you know, how do we take the revealed sources along with the recognized story excuse me, articulation of the meaning of those sources, how do we place them into meaningful conversation with the realities that actually define, circumscribe, and inform our lives? That's right. And and for those, again, you know, I, I don't want to throw around these academic terms. It's just assuming that our listeners are going to keep up is the very essence of what we mean when we say a negotiated construct, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking about translating, uh, in this case, Revelation, the Quran, or the prophetic teachings, uh, and engaging them in a conversation. No, 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 no. With, I think see, this yeah. is where this is where I do differ somewhat. I, I don't think it's just the Quran and the uh, and, and the and and, and, and the Sunnah. Sure. Um, because because if it's just the Quran and the Sunnah, I mean, you can get lots and lots of very different uh, interpretations out of uh, the Quran and Sunnah. Right. Um, it's the Quran and Sunnah as these have been articulated by um, the community of Muslims that we recognize as being uh, sort of the authentic community right. in terms of its custodianship of these sources and of these communally sort of understood and articulated meanings of these sources. Certainly. I, I, I was speaking more to the sort of earliest, com- earliest community of Muslims mm-hmm. and, their, and, the, and, the, and the fact that this has always been a, the reality, whether you go back mm-hmm. to the first century of Islam or you're talking about Muslim scholarship today. That's what mm-hmm. I was that, that's what I meant when I said. Yeah. You know, yeah. But I mean, I think I think one of the things that sort of may complicate this a bit is this, is that, you know, the early community is responding in a very spontaneous manner. That is to say that what they are getting out of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the legacy that is remembered from the Prophet's actual presence here among the community of of Muslims, they are interpreting that in a context in which they they are spontaneous in their interpretation. There are no uh, sort of superior civilizations out there basically dictating to them that you should be trying to reconcile this stuff with this. Right. Um, and that should be the litmus test in terms of whether or not you are really sort of arriving at interpretations that are valuable. Mm-hmm. I think now part of the problem is that Muslims will tend to want to sort of seek refuge in um, um, what you might want to call prefabricated understandings of um, Islam in all of its aspects, um, because they resent this whole notion that we should have to be, uh, you know, reinterpret Islam in light of realities that are not our doing. Wow! Right. 
<laughs> There's a lot to process there. <laughs> I'm taking it all oh, in. Still with us? I've I've just been listening. I've I'm, I'm it's it, it, for me it's it's like sitting at coffee and just listening to two people who are way above my intellectual pay grade and just sort of let, letting it soak in. That's Parvez's <laughs> fault. You know that, right? <laughs> That's what. <laughs> That's Parvez's fault. <laughs> but I mean, let me let me just try and let me just try and 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 and, and sort of simplify that. Then um. no, I'd love for you to do that. And I think this also, like for example, the way I think you engage a lot of this in your book, in particular, uh, Islam in the in the problem of black suffering. You know, picking up a conversation that is already happening within sort of. Uh, you know, Christian, you know, Christian theology and I'm sorry, black, you know, like in the black community mm-hmm. is fascinating. And I think that would make it, uh, that, that'd be a good starting point. Well, I mean, the, the whole idea of, of Islam and the problem of black suffering is simply this. I think that, um, and this is especially true in the post 9-11 moment in which we live. Right. Um, Muslims are not going to be the only ones now reading the Quran, uh, picking up, you know, collections of hadith and trying to understand, well, what is this Islam thing? Mm -hmm. Um, We now live in a context where people want to know what Islam is, what it represents, what it aspires to. And uh, we also are, you know, we live with the history of Islam. I'm sorry, of religion. Um, as it grew out of the European experience. So people have certain uh, expectations of religion. They have certain suspicions of religion. They have certain fears about religion. And many of those fears are a product of of European history, not so much of Islamic history. And we can get to the ISIS thing and all that later on. But the whole idea that to the extent that you allow religion to express itself openly, you are bound to divine society, and you are bound to produce, you know, fissures that are unbridge- unbridgeable within society. Um, and this, this, you know, this is this comes out of the whole sort of European wars of religion and the whole and the whole nine yards. Um, and I and I and I and I think that what we have to recognize then is that there are these questions out there about Islam um, within the context of the Western society in which we live. And, uh, you know, Christianity has had to face these questions, but now we are here in the same society. We live in the same context in which Christianity is living in the West. Those questions will come to us as well. So, you know, the whole point of the problem, uh, Islam and the problem of black suffering, is to anticipate these questions coming in, into the Muslim community, just like they came into the Christian community and into the Jewish community. And I think that whether these are questions of our producing or not, they are questions that we will have to confront. And so what I'm trying to do in that book is to put forth um, um, sort of an example of how Muslim theology um, would, uh, would, would approach this question of how do you explain the reality of black suffering, um, disproportional, trans- transgenerational, enormous suffering in the context of a claim that God is all powerful and God is all good. All good. Now that question came to the Jewish community mm-hmm. um, and Rabbi Richard Rubenstein uh, wrote about this. It came to the Christian community. Um, James, uh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name now. Jones, William R. Jones, uh, is God a white racist uh, wrote about it. And the black theologians have been, have been writing about it. And so um, my, uh, my point was that this is not something, I mean, Islam also considers God to be all powerful and God to be all good. Um, and if that question was relevant for Christians, relevant for Jews, it's going to be relevant for Muslims as well. Um, and so, you know, we have to take it upon ourselves to be able to put forth um, where Islam stands on uh, these kinds of issues, because they are not issues that we can simply avoid or ignore. Now, the point that I was making earlier is that some Muslims uh, may say, well, look, that's really the West's problem. That's not our problem. Um, slavery, for example, was never racialized in um, in Islam. Right. So, you know, let them deal with that problem. Um, and, you know, 
I resent the whole idea that Islam should be dragged into a conversation that it really has nothing that has nothing to do with it. This is a Western problem. Um, let the West, um, you know, worry about it. Um, and on some level, I guess you know, uh, you know, some 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 Muslims will think like that. Um, but I don't think that that kind of attitude will be enough um, to prevent these questions from confronting Islam front and center. We now live in the West, and whether we like it or not, many of the West's problems, issues, uh, presumptions, points of departure, um, they are as uh, much a, 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 a fact of our lives uh, as they are the lives of non-Muslims. And this is the new context in which Islam has to articulate itself. And I think we have to be very careful um, that because we live in a context where we are not the ascending civilization, we can too carelessly internalize many of the, many of the presumptions and points of departure um, that come from uh, a, a, a Western approach to religion that is suspicious mm -hmm. of religion, mm -hmm. um, that is perhaps uh, d dismissive yes, yes, of religion, yes. mm -hmm. um, that is hostile toward religion, um, and if we're not careful, we can internalize many of those sensibilities and then bring these into, you know, our articulations of Islam. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not naive uh, to the point of uh, in any way suggesting that, you know, this is not easy, uh, simple. I mean, there are risks uh, in in involved, and that's why I think that, you know, Muslims have to be very assiduous in the way in which they approach these things, because um, whether we like it or not, we are making history here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, this is wanna, this will be the platform on which you know future generations. Um, this will be their point of departure. Correct, correct. Uh, I want to pick up on that idea of risk a little later. Uh, one of the things that I, I know you've said on a number of occasions, in fact, something that's informed a lot of the way in which I tend to view not only the uh, the role and the place of the Muslim community in America, but certainly what's happening. Um, just in, in, in modern times in general. And that is this idea of, and I think this is very relevant today, that you know the greatest challenge to religion is not persecution, mm -hmm. but rather the greatest challenge to religion is apathy grown or born of, irrele of mm -hmm. irrelevance. Right. And I think that a lot of what you're talking about, um, you know, certainly in terms of, okay, well, how does Muslim theology or Muslim intellectual history in general or in, as an aggregate uh, deal with whether it's the problem of, of black suffering, whether it's the problem of ISIS or whatever. I mean, how do you now, you know, translate or, sorry, enter into a conversation uh, with Muslim tradition um, into, into, into issues that are relevant and modern and, and certainly lived realities today? Mm -hmm. Well, no, I think that what we simply do is the same thing that Muslim tradition did. I mean, you don't yeah. imagine there were no Mu'tazila, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the time of the Prophet. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he was not addressing Zoroastrians and Manichaeans and even maybe perhaps uh, up in places like Bakht, uh, Buddhists and other people like that. Mm -hmm. And what Muslim tradition is, uh, is, uh, is intent on doing is, is taking these realities as realities and then articulating Islam in such a way that preserves its integrity while at the same time speaking effectively to these realities. And I personally, I mean, I just see that as being um, what Islam has done all along. Now, there are two things that I think I want to say here. One is that, as I said before, I mean, this, this can be risky business, especially when you live in a context where you are not the ascending civilization. And when that is the case, you will tend to try to sort of reconcile what you're doing with the standards, the dictates, the, the sensibilities of the ascending civilization, even if some of those uh, sensibilities are not consistent with Islam. And this is where the risk comes in. And so we end up um, sort of uh, uh, interpreting Islam uh, in such a manner that really um, demotes the Qur'an and the Sunnah as the true hmm. basis of our articulations and sort of promotes Western sensibilities, Western points of departure, um, you know, Western concepts um, as being the real litmus test for whether or not we are successful in this whole enterprise of trying to articulate Islam. This is, this is one of the dangers. 
Um, and so, you know, to the extent that Islam comes out promoting all of the things that the West says are good, then we have a good interpretation of Islam. To the extent that Islam comes out not promoting the things that the West says are good, then, you know, we have a, uh, an unsuccessful, um, you know, a, a, a retrograde uh, understanding of Islam. Clearly in all of that, Islam has lost its place as the ultimate criterion for how we judge ourselves in terms of our engagement of Islam. So that's one, mm. one of the risks. The other thing that we have to recognize is that, and, 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 and I think many Muslims are a little bit uncomfortable with this. I mean, Islam has never been a single articulation. I mean, you know, you know, pluralism is a fact of Islam. And so when Muslims get into this whole business of, you know, let's, let's look at Islam and how it would address the problem of black suffering from a theological perspective, I don't think um, we will necessarily all arrive at a single articulation uh, of Islam. Some of those articulations will be to my liking, some, some, some will not. Um, but, but, this is, but this is the process, and this is what Islam has always dealt with. There's never been, I mean, you know, certainly not from the time that quote-unquote classical Islam comes into its own, you know, the number of issues on which they, there has been a, a unanimous consensus have been the minority. On the majority of issues, there's always been more than one. Uh, more than one opinion. And I think that, you know, while many of the opinions that come out of this attempt to place Islam into conversation with the realities of American reality, some of those are articulations will not be my to like, will not be uh, to my liking. Okay. Hmm. Um, and I will articulate why that is the case. And, 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 and maybe I will persuade those uh, who differ with me that, uh, that my idea is, uh, is, is better and maybe not, but, but, but this is Islam. Um, and in the absence of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, coming back and identifying one of these parties as the right party and the other as wrong, I mean, we have to continue this whole, uh, this whole business of, uh, of negotiation. Um, and, and, and of course, there, 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 there are risks there. But, you know, ultimately, if Muslims are, are still holding on to um, an organic understanding of Islam, ultimately, we have to recognize the fact that... Um, Guidance, divine guidance, is a reality. Um, and ultimately, that's what we all want. Um, and, and, and so the idea that um, everything will be determined solely on the basis of how reasonable or rational uh, my arguments are, um, I think that's, a, that's an idea that we have to be very careful about. Because I can be very reasonable, very rational, very rational. And wrong. <laughs> That's right. And arrive at the wrong conclusion, right? In spite of having right. sound logic or sound That's rationality. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So ultimately what we're looking at is, you know, how do we approach God's pleasure? Right. This reminds me of something you wrote. Uh, I think it was in the introduction to a book. Um, the idea of the notion of legitimate particularity, something I think you borrow from Goldzer, right? In, in terms of talking about this idea of Muslim, Muslim history or Muslim intellectual history always acknowledging the fact that it was never a monolith. Right. And, appreci and, and, and not only acknowledging it, but celebrating that idea. Yeah, and see, one of the, point, one of the, one of the problems I have part of it is, I mean, if, as I said, you know, I, I become a Muslim, I think, in 1978. By 1982, you know, I'm in the Muslim world. And That's right. I'm studying classical scholars, not, not modern Muslim movements. And I think that anybody whose point of departure is a classical tradition, this is so unproblematic. Um, and again, I think that, you know, in the West, you know, in the, in, the, in the 18th century, you know, you had situations where rulers were determining the religious affiliation from, for everybody who lived in their domain. Islam never had that. That's right. Neither among Muslims nor, among, uh, uh, nor, the, nor for non-Muslims. And so the idea that, you know, uh, Islam is very at home with, 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 with a reasonable pluralism. And, and, and that's, that's an important point to make as well. Of course, not everything goes. Um, but there, there, there are lots of opinions on which, um, you know, the, the, the greatest Muslim scholars could simply say, I don't think that's the right opinion. But I'm not to the point where I could say that this violates the standards of 
um, of, of interpretation, the, the standards of due diligence that we as a Muslim community recognize um, to the point where I can place this outside the fold of Islam. That's right. I, and I think this is something that's often missed, you know, a, a point you just made, when, you know, especially in these conversations about, you know, banning Sharia from certain jurisdictions and, you know, all, all these state legislators and lawmakers trying to uh, put it on the books that we're not going to consider Sharia is that, well, for one, Sharia itself is not some sort of a codified mm -hmm. law. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, even even throughout Muslim history, is something you alluded to that, you know, even under the apparatus of a quote unquote Muslim state, uh, the application of one law for all people uh, was not something that was found. Yeah, that's that, that's a, that's an accoutrement of the modern state, and I think that's that right. you know, these, these Sharia anti Sharia bills and all these things. I mean, they're yes. they're based on you know I would say a combination um, of one ignorance and then two just blatant bigotry. That's right. That's right. Um, there are people in this society who fear. Um, that look, either we are dominated or we dominate. And these Muslims are coming here, you know, they're rising in numbers, you know, they're an educated community, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we want to make sure that they are dominated uh, for fear that if they are not dominated, um, then they stand to dominate us. Um, you know, this is just, this is just bigotry. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, but again, I think that Muslims too, you know, have to be very clear about what is Sharia then, um, what does it advocate, um, what 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 is its attitude toward uh, the American political sphere, um, what is the relationship between Sharia and the U.S. Constitution? Can it recognize it? Does it not? If not, what do you want non-Muslims to do? I mean, these are all issues that have to be very, I think, clearly articulated. And I think that, you know, one of the risks that we run right now is that if Muslims are not at the forefront of articulating these things, they will be articulated for Muslims by those who have the attitudes that we see in some of these anti-Sharia bills. Right. They will be it's out there telling everybody mm -hmm. what Sharia is. Right. Right. Informed of bigotry and ignorance. Of course. You know, and by the way, I mean, again, I, let, let, let's be fair here. I mean, you know, neither ignorance nor bigotry are uh, exclusive uh, 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 yeah. property uh, right. of non-Muslims. Right. Muslims have a lot of ignorance and a lot of bigotry of their own. Certainly, certainly. Uh, and I would argue, and I mean, one of the, the, like the point I was making earlier, I mean, ignorance of their own Muslim intellectual history, of their own intellectual history, of their own tradition. Of course. And so much of, of the way in which they view their own, uh, you know, whether it's praxi or it's their own tradition, is, is, is it comes from a completely a like a framework that isn't, you know, articulated or, or you know, is, isn't something that uh, is historically valid and correct. Well, yeah, but I think that, again, I mean, we have to be careful about that as well. I mean, look, I believe Muslim tradition is a point of departure. But you do have to make a decision here. Right. We start talking about historically valid. Uh huh. Okay, this may X may be historically valid, but that doesn't resolve the issue because the issue is okay. Then do you want to go back to X, or do you recognize that X was valid in a particular historical context, and now we need a new X for That's a right. new historical context? That's right. Um, and simply try to black box that X into this space. I mean. That 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 that's potentially problematic. Agreed. Agreed. Huh. Agreed. Wow. Uh, I think I think and you know if we could you know like I, I in my view or in my estimation one of the other ways in which uh, you com you combat ignorance and bigotry is to uh, create a a culture a produce a culture that is meaningful and relevant. Um, and I know that's something that you write about. You talk about this idea mm -hmm. of Muslim unleashing their cultural genius, their, you know, the idea of cultural production. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that being something that has always been the earmark of Muslim civilization as well. Mm -hmm. It's his ability to create 
uh, to negotiate cultural space wherever it's gone and to create and foster a, a, a culture that is relevant as well as that is not alien. Yeah, you know, but to be honest with you, to be honest uh-huh. with you, guys, I mean, I, 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 I begin, you know, even to, to, to question some of my own articulations about that because I think that they may be a bit um, too, uh, uh, you know, too drenched in this notion that culture is purely instrumental. It's purely instrumental. Yes, it's purely instrumental. What do you Uh, mean by that? I mean that we use culture um, to promote this or that. Now, I'm not denying that there is an instrumental dimension to culture, but, but culture is not purely instrumental. Culture is where we are. I see what you're right? saying. Right. In other words, I mean, so, we want to live life, not always being, you know, in the position where we're trying to use it for this or use it for that. Right. Uh, so I think that part, what part of what we need to do is get back to the understanding of, 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 of Islam as more than just religion in the narrow Protestant modern notion of, you know, interiorized belief that Islam is a civilization. It has right. this civilizational dimension. And, 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 and it is the expression of that, because that's where most people are on a daily basis. Most right. people are not with me, with all these books on theology, all these books on law and legal methodology. Most people are far removed from that. Mm-hmm. Most people live in the world of, okay, how do I engage friendship Okay, how do I engage neighbors, strangers? All right, um, how do I fill up the space between the masjid and my home? All right, that's where most people. That's where most people are, and I think that the point that I'm making about unleashing Muslim cultural genius is not so much to instrumentalize it, but right. to allow Muslims to develop a relationship with friendship, a relationship with neighbor, a relationship even with strangers. Um, a relationship with spare time, okay, um, that that does not split them into 15 different pieces, um, all of which tend to contradict each other, that there is this at-homeness with my religious sensibilities, all right, even as I engage you as a friend, even as I engage you as a neighbor, all right, I can enjoy your friendship, um, I can have fun, I mean fun that does not leave me guilt-ridden, all right, because fun um, um, and Islam are not mutually exclusive, all right? How do I come up with cultural expressions that really carry that message? And, and one of the things that, you know, I, 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 I ask myself this question sometimes, um, and this is going to be a little bit controversial because, um, you know, there are lots of sensibilities out there about this kind of thing. Um, hmm. but let me try and keep it less controversial. I mean, I, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I take somebody like take somebody like Abu Nawaz. Now, Abu Nawaz is this poet, you know, in the Abbasid period. The guy talks about wine drinking, like like it's crazy. The guy, you know, pederastery. I mean, the guy. I mean, you know, moral corruption. I mean, you know. His poetry is full of this stuff. Right. And I ask myself, why didn't Abu Nawaz just apostatize? Why didn't he just leave Islam? You know, I want to drink wine. You know, I want to be with boys. I want to chase women. I want to, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, Islam won't let me do this. I'm out of here. Yeah. Why, why didn't he just leave Islam? Um, what was it about Islam that kept Abu Nawaz identifying as a Muslim? Right? Hmm, right. And one of the things I, I, I suspect is that there was this civilizational matrix right. in which he lived. That's that right. was simply too, too powerful, too important, too meaningful to him. That's right. All right? These contradictions notwithstanding. And we're all a bunch of contradictions on some level. Right. Um, but this is the power of Islam, a civilization. Yeah, yeah. And we can see at the end of all these guys' lives. Well, in the, you know, end of, you know, somebody like up in the West, oh, and turns around and writes religious poetry and, you know, and all these kinds of things. But Islam has this civilizational power to it. All right. Yeah. 
to to touch people, to caress people, you know, to be with people where they are on their daily basis. People who are not theologians, who are not jurists, who do not sit around, you know, reading legal theory and all these kinds of things, um, but 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 can embrace them. You know, and all their contradictions and flaws, and keep them aspiring to be Muslims. Mm-hmm. That's civilization. That's culture. All right. 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 Um, and, and it's. I mean, I. I don't think. I mean, and certainly you would agree. Someone like Abu Nawaz is not anomalous, right? right. I mean, you. You know, uh, well, like I think. Well, look at Farabi. Look at him in Sina. Why did these guys just say look? Yeah. Man, no, not. even in just poets, you look look at someone like Omar Khayyam. You look at someone right. from the subcontinent like Mirza Ghalib. I, you know, who who write about erotic love and about 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 uh, about wine drinking and like you're saying, but at the same well, time, we remain. Whoa, 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 erotic love is fine. It's it's the boundaries that these guys. No, 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 no. I know, I know what you mean. But, but, but I don't want to give people the impression that well. Yes, certainly, you certainly. Stuff, you, you don't. Certainly. You know all this erotic love stuff. I mean that's. You know. I mean Ibn Hazm writes about erotic love, so. Of course. Of <laughs> right. course. Right. Right. Course. So. And then, which one thing? I mean, we have this integrated self, I and mean, and one of the exactly. one of the problems that I I I suspect that we hit in modern times is right. Um, there's something I'm still thinking about. I'll go out on a limb and just share my thoughts at the moment on it. Please, please. Um, is that I think that, you know, and, and, and I gave a lecture about this in Doha uh, in Arabic. Maybe I'll send it to you sometime. But uh, the point that I made is this. Um, um, I, I, I suspect that when the colonizers come to Muslim lands, you know, um, it is the ulama of Sharia who seem to hold the key to any kind of legitimization. And so what they understand is that they have to displace both Sharia and the legitimizing power that it contains in order to be able to open the way for their own rule in these, in these territories. And so what that produces is a reaction where Muslims have to retrench and circle the wagons around Sharia. Right. What this does, however, is that it tends to block everything else out. Exactly. So the idea becomes, if we reinstate Sharia, then we've reinstated Islam. We get it, we get it all back. We get it all back. Right. It becomes the... It becomes all, the this uh, all this civilizational, all this intellectual, and all these other pursuits, yeah. all right, uh, don't receive the, the priority that they, should, that they should receive. And we end up overly, obsessively focused on Sharia even our understanding of tajdeed or reform today, right. it's all about reform in Sharia. All right? That's right. That's right. Uh, not understanding that your kids and my kids, you know, you know, you know, a cool outfit can be just as permissible as an uncool outfit. Sharia is not going to determine what's cool and what's not cool. All right? The question becomes, where is the intellectual genius? Where is the cultural genius? All right, um, that will that will produce, you know, this sensibility of cool, that also does not erect these seeming barriers between that and my religious sensibility and identity. These are not issues of Sharia. These are issues of cultural genius. Um, these are issues of, of of civilization. All right, you know, one of my favorite masjids in the world. Is the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, in Turkey. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You ask yourself, I mean, the guy built this. Look at the religious imagination. Look, look at what goes into this. And, and much of it is appropriated, you know, from, you know, old Byzantine architecture and, you know, and all these kinds of things. But, but right. look at this. Look, look at this. Look, 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 look at the, the power of, 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 of caressing, you know, that, that it carries. Yeah. You're not going to get that from studying Sharia. All right, and the idea that Sharia and Sharia scholars and Sharia scholarship is all that we need to bring it back, I think that's a fallacy that we've fallen into, and I think that's one that we need to get beyond. Right. Right. Um, we, we, you know, we need not simply theoretical articulations of is, of, 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 of of Islam, but practical um, sort of. Pra- when I say practical, I mean in practice. You know, how do we come back? to an enjoyment of Muslim community um, that is not pastist, that is not guilt-ridden, 
um, that 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 is not overly dependent on um, values and presuppositions and sensibilities that um, that either challenge or alienate Islam. How how do we come back? How do we come back to that? Mm, mm. No, I think it's some. Yeah, I mean, you 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 said so, so many profound so, so, things. So, 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 I mean, bottom line is that everybody has their role. I mean, and there may be yeah. people who are not jurists um, who who are going to play. I mean, if you look at Islam in America, take somebody like Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Look at that. That's right. Look at that. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, you know, there are people out there who are artists. You know, who are architects. Who are interior, interior decorators, uh, designers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, why leave all of that genius mm-hmm. thinking that it has no contribution to make to the texture of Muslim life? All right, mm-hmm. to the point that okay, fine, it goes off and dumps all that genius someplace else. Someplace else. Um, I, I think that I think that's highly I think that's highly problematic. Right. And this, to me, is part of again bringing Islam into meaningful conversation with the realities that that define and inform our lives. Mm, mm. So much to get to, Professor Jackson. Uh, you know, I, I don't even know where to. <laughs> we're, we're we're running right past the ninety minute mark, you, and you started uh, you it with all this intellectual stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm I, I'm I'm going to apologize to your audience. No, no, not at all. I think that that's this has been fascinating, and in fact, I mean. You know, we, this gives us more of a reason to have you back sooner than later, because um, yeah. <laughs> we didn't even get to talk about uh, uh, one of the things I really wanted to talk about, which was your most recent book, mm-hmm. um, which is Initiative to Stop the Violence. Um, so that's assassinate, Assassins in the Renunciation of Political Violence. Mm-hmm. If you could very, very briefly um, to our listeners, um, because they can go and get a copy um, of, of, of the book uh, yeah. from Amazon, from the Yale University Press. Yeah. Speak a little briefly about where how that comes about because I think that it, it represents, in some ways, a departure from some of your some of mm-hmm. your most recent works, but mm-hmm. at the same time, not so much because it, no. it, it continues well, in that same vein. Just, I, I want to make two points about that book. Uh, mm-hmm. One of them that I I I I I, I, I gleaned as a subtle um, interpretation of that book that's not quite accurate. And I mean, let me get to that second, but. Um, you know, I, I arrived in Egypt my first time when I went back in 1982 um, as a student. Um, this is about six months after Sadat was assassinated. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was, you know, I was there, you know, just sort of witnessing the, the aftermath and, and all that that had produced out of this. And I, you know, I would read the papers and I'd read all these kinds of things going on. And I, at that time, I didn't really understand them in their full context. But, but what I came to see later on was the following. Um, you know, the people who, the guys who killed Sadat, they went to prison. Uh, five of them got executed. Um, but the Gamaha Islamiyah, which was the largest faction among these people, um, I mean, to give you a sense of their size, at one point, um, the number of imprisoned Gamaha members was estimated between twenty and 30,000. That's just the number in prison, not on the outside. Right. Um, so these guys were huge. And in prison, they began to study Sharia, to study their actual tradition. And to make a very long story short, they came to the conclusion, you know what? We were wrong. We were wrong. Um, this violence against uh, uh, the Egyptian state, this a violence against our own society, um, this does not promote the interest of Islam. Mm-hmm. And we're not backing off of our commitment to the establishment of an, of an Islamic state to the reinstatement of Sharia as our code of life. They are still committed to that, but they're saying this wanton violence is not consistent with the law of God. So in 1997, they renounced political violence. Mm-hmm. And in 2002, they issue a series of manifestos that um, articulate why it is that they're renouncing violence. And they call it a, a realistic perspective and a Sharia-based approach. And what they're saying is two things. Islamist movements have to pay attention to the realities of the modern world. All right? Not look at them agnostically. Not ignore them. Not sort of try to, you know, swoosh them away. But to confront them as they are. That's number one. And two, they have to then have a Sharia approach 
to this reality once it has been correctly understood. So they produced these series of manifestos called uh, Correcting Misunderstandings. And the first installation is the foundational one. It is called uh, Initiative to Stop the Violence, a, uh, realistic, a realistic perspective and a Sharia-based approach. And in it, they lay out why it is that they feel now that what they did in 1981 was wrong and what Sharia has to say about how Muslims go about the business of reinstating Sharia uh, in the context of their own Muslim society. Now, what I found to be interesting and one of the reasons that um, I wanted to translate this book into English was the following. Um, These guys renounced political violence in 1997. Have you heard about it? No. It's a very it's a very little known fact That's um, right. in, 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 in in the West. Right. Um, they produced these manifestos in 2002. That's 13 years ago. Um, right. And still they have not um, sort of been looked upon as a meaningful movement within the context of modern Islam. Uh-huh. This is despite the fact that these guys, again, um, they have massive street credibility. Um, and they are not quote unquote liberals or progressives or whatever, whatever you want to, whatever label you want to use. They yes. are committed Islamists who are saying that Sharia, Sharia is telling us that this is not the way in which we are supposed to proceed. So I thought that that was a message that would be very important for both non Muslims in the West to hear, as well as some Muslims in the West to hear. Yeah. All right especially coming from people who about whom it could not be said that they're just, you know, soft, fell out, soft, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, this is OG. Uh, We're talking OG, right? In the, in the modern sort absolutely. of cool. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You can't get any more OG than that. These guys do decades in right. prison. Right. All right. Um, and you know, they come out with, uh, with this articulation and I thought it was very important, um, that this be part of the discussion about Islamist movements in the modern world, because the West wants, I mean, the West is obsessed with the, with the Qaeda, the ISIS version, mm-hmm. and uh, it just completely ignores, um, you know, these kinds of activities, these kinds of movements that are going on, I mean, as we speak. So sort of to balance out the picture and especially to provide, you know, Americans and even perhaps more especially American Muslims with access to a discourse, all right, that is not apologetic, but that is thoroughly grounded in an understanding of and a commitment to Sharia in terms of how we address this issue of wanton violence in the name of Islam. Mm. Well, Professor Jackson, again, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to say now, they are not traditional uh, ulama, they are not as Hadis, uh, although they study with as Hadis, and they themselves take it upon themselves to study the tradition, and they come up with their own understanding of it. Right. Um, um, some people have the sense that, well, are you advocating that people move away from the ulama in terms of their articulations of Islam? I'm not advocating anything. I'm simply showcasing what actually happened. All right. That's what you meant when you uh, said you gleaned an interpretation of, of, of your book. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, because they do not rely on right. uh, as hadith, although they do go back to Muslim tradition and okay. they are quoting a Shatibi and Ibn Taymiyyah and right. Al-Hastafi and all kinds of other uh, uh, scholars uh, in their in their articulation. So they have access to uh, Muslim tradition um, right. to the point of. Uh, coming up with an understanding of Sharia that tells them that this is not the way to go. And again, um, you know, these are battle-hardened, you know, committed Islamists um, who are saying not that, well, you know, the West doesn't like this. Well, you know, this makes us look bad. Well, you know, this makes us look barbaric. No, Sharia says we not do this. Like sort of post 9-11 expediency. This, is, this isn't that. Uh, no. no. Well, <laughs> exactly. Because it starts, 
it starts 1997. Right, exactly. No, no, that, that's what I, hasn't even happened then. Exactly, my, my point exactly. Um, By the way, this is one of my fears right now about what's going on in Egypt. Because no society can take, you know, I mean, society can only take so much. Um, and it is a fact. If you, you know, if you go into the, into the, the, the introduction I do to this work, the prison experience in the Muslim world contributes a lot to the radicalization of Islamists. And what's going on now um, with the, the, the massive incarceration, you know, handing down of, you know, uh, death sentences, um, um, yeah. uh, group death sentences, um, you know, my, my, I hope that this campaign on the part of the Gama will, will hold up. Um, I, I, I fear that, you know, there are limits. And if the present trend continues, I mean, we might hit that limit. Um, that's one of my biggest fears about what's going on in Egypt right now. But for the moment, they seem to be holding court. Mm. So, again, Professor Jackson, we could have you on to talk about uh, so many things, and, and we'd love to have you on again very soon, sort of a continuation of our conversation. Um, I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't do two things. One is if I didn't ask you about uh, your most recent uh, opportunity to meet with President Obama. You were among a group of Muslim American leaders, I think, back in February, who met with him. Uh, you were, I think, among uh, – yeah, you, you were chosen to make sort of prepared remarks to the president. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that meeting was actually off the record, so I can't make any uh, – Oh, I right. I can't, I can't make any uh, direct articulations. I can Thank say you. that in a general sense um, – I mean, I can't make any direct uh, attributions. Right. Um, um, there was an attempt, you know, to reorient the president's thinking about Islam to the point where Islam in America, um, uh, because he's the president of America and American Muslims are his constituents, um, so that Islam in America, um, becomes more prominent in his thinking when he thinks about Muslims, mm -hmm. that that we as American Muslims are not always um, just sort of um, dumped into this basket of what's going on, um, you know, 8,000 miles away, um, as if that uh, can represent our thinking, our sensibilities, our interests um, uh, as Muslims, uh, as Muslims in America. Um, and to think uh, in that context about all the contributions um, that Muslims have made uh, have made to America. I think that one of the things that Islam does not get uh, uh, sufficient uh, credit for um, is all the contributions that Muslims have and continue to make uh, to America. And I, I'll say, especially, especially um, in poor Black communities in America, um, where Islam has reached and has reformed um, and has. Uh, um, really lightened the path for a, a, a demographic that the rest of society has basically given up on. Um, Islam has proven itself in that regard, and I think that there needs to be more recognition of that and more of an investment um, in, that, in that very fact. So part of what was um, articulated to the president uh, was exactly this, um, that, you know, I know that the media, you know, tends to calibrate all of our sensitivities to the point that, you know, the word Islam means Middle East. Um, but I think it's uh, I think it's important uh, for uh, it to be recognized that um, the Muslim community in America is in the millions, in the millions of, of American citizens and, you know, their perspective, their realities their sensibilities, their aspirations, their hopes, their fears right. um, has to be a part of what the president of the United States uh, is thinking um, when he thinks Islam. Mm. So here we are again at an, uh, uh, on the crux of another uh, election. So that uh, I think that, that 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 whole idea really kind of scares me in terms of uh, how 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 understanding or receptive um, you know, the present landscape looks uh, with regards to, you know, that community? Well, 
Look, I think that I think that we have some um, I think that we have some serious challenges uh, serious challenges ahead. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that we should not misread uh, these the, these challenges. Enemies are not always bad. Enemies sometimes keep you sharp. They keep you aware of what you really stand for. Um, they, 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 they force you sometime to dig deep down and come up with your best self. Mm. And I think that, um, I think that the coming years will, um, will do that for many of us. Um, for some of us, we will, we will run for cover. Um, but for, for many of us, um, it will bring us to the point where we have to locate our best, our best, um, our best selves, um, and 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 to bring our best resources um, to bear on the future of our reality in this country. Um, and I think that in some ways it will force us um, out of the luxury uh, of, of of thinking that um, we can just, I mean, just float through life. Um, without making our commitments uh, explicitly known, known both to ourselves and both to others. So again, I mean, as I said, I think that yeah, we're in for some. Uh, I think we're in for some difficult days. Um, um, but difficulty, um, difficulty is not all. Difficulty is not all bad. I mean, okay. the, the the you know you know the legacy of the Prophet Salam, If it teaches us nothing, it teaches us that you know ultimately we have to do the best that we can do. And there are no guarantors of success other than Allah. And what he wills to be successful will be successful. And what he does will not. What we have to do, we have to always be clear in our commitment. And I think that um, sometimes when you are put on the spot, you're forced to, to come to terms with what you really are. Um, and I think that we could use some of that, quite frankly. Yeah, here's here's hoping, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's a that's a wonderful uh, place to close out. I can't think of any other but better place, um, Professor Jackson. I, I've done this on record on the past, but I think I'd be remiss not to do it to have you on the show, uh, or while we have you on the show. Um, the very the very title of our show, Diffuse Congruence, <laughs> you know, comes from comes from your writings and your teachings. Um, and, 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 I, and I've, I've, I've shared with the audience where that comes from and, and how that sort of emanates from Muslim tradition. Uh, and I think in, in many ways, it sort of dovetails on something that you've said throughout the show, which is this idea of, 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 of having a conversation with our tradition, but in a way that is meaningful. And that's what we're hoping to doing, hoping to do with this podcast. So, um, I think, uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to being with us uh, and to uh, sharing your experiences, your, uh, your insight uh, with us. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Parvez, and I, I want to congratulate you on, uh, on, this, uh, on this show. Um, I, I really do think that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we do need more of is the, the ability to come together and to, to exchange ideas, experiences, and to actually um, encounter each other. I think that one of, the, one of the problems that Islam in America faces right now is that with all of the, 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 the optics of media coverage of Islam in the world, um, the, the, the basic human faculty of encounter, the, the ability mm-hmm counter other human beings as human beings has been degraded and diminished. And, uh, you know, this uh, works in favor of the forces of bigotry and ignorance in this country. So what you're trying to do now, I think, enhances the ability on the part of people to engage, you know, Muslims as human beings. And, and whether we, we, we agree with them or, or not, you know, as long as our, our, our faculty of human encounter uh, is intact, um, then we can find ways other than, you know, bigotry and prejudice, um, blind bigotry and prejudice, because um, not all prejudice is bad, but that's another, that's another. <laughs> we'll save that for, for <laughs> another two. show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but blind bigotry and, and, and prejudice um, that refuses to engage me, you know, as, as a human being, or I refuse to engage the other uh, as a human being. Spaces right. like this. I think make a make a healthy contribution to bridging that gap. So congratulations and uh, keep up the good work, man. 
Well, thank you uh, so much. <laughs> yeah, that means a lot. That means a lot. And I don't think Azaki or I could could have uh, sort of articulated any better in terms of what the, uh, the, the, the the sort of real or one of the purposes of the show has been and continues to be. So thank you so much for those for your thoughts on that. Well, Jazakum Allah khair and uh, keep up the good work. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. All right. And and with that, uh, that wraps up our fascinating, this is our, the longest conversation that we've had on Diffuse Congruence and, and for a show that prides itself on conversations, uh, that's that's uh, definitely a high bar for us. So we're, we're uh, very excited to be able to share this with everybody. And uh, to everyone listening, please do seek us out online. We're at facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. You can also email us, Diffuse Congruence at gmail.com. Pervez, you're on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? Oh, and I think Professor Jackson will appreciate this. It's at the new Madhub, M-A-D-D-M-A-D-H-H-A-B. <laughs> and Zucky, how about yourself? Where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, I'm at uh, Zucky's Corner. That's the A-K-I-S Corner. I'm also at the Huffington Post, where my uh, reviews and interviews go up regularly, as does this show. And um, with that, that wraps up uh, this episode. Thank you once again to Dr. Jackson for coming on. And uh, we will catch you all in the audience next time. Thank you for listening. <laughs>